Hello, everybody. We are live. Welcome to today's uh, session of the Golden Path to Spring One. I'm really thrilled uh, for today's guests. Uh, they are uh, uh, Sam Snyder and Justine Gehring from Modern. And if you have been keeping up with us, then you know that uh, just at the end of April, April 20th, we've had Jonathan Schneider, who is the founder of Modern. And so here we have two of his team members joining us um, for to just sort of go a little bit deeper and broader into this really fascinating topic and of automatic refactoring of applications or mass refactoring uh, and try to cover a little uh, more topics and learn more. So really fascinating topic. I'm excited for today. So uh, yeah, welcome, uh, Sam and Justine. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, so happy to see all of you here. How are you doing, Justine? Yeah. I'm doing good. How about you, Sam? <laughs> great, thanks. <laughs> where are you guys joining from? So I'm in Seattle uh, at my home. Uh, yeah, where are you at, Justine? Nice. I'm in Montreal. We've got a beautiful sunny day, even though it's uh, just about to be the beginning of summer. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you're really uh, across the across the, the continent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we have a few, uh, a few team members in Europe as well. So we're, uh, we're, we're just a small but widely distributed company at this point. Right. Right. Is everybody working remotely at this point? Yeah, we don't have a have a central office. Not yet, huh? All right. So, um, okay. I, I this topic is so fascinating. I want you to be talking about it for as much of the time as possible. So, all I want to say to those folks joining us is we are going to keep an eye on the chat. So, please uh, feel free to let us know where you're joining from. Definitely put your questions up on the chat as soon as you think of them. If uh, I will try to politely interrupt Sam and Justine if they don't immediately see them themselves and then we'll take any any leftover questions or additional questions at the end. Um, so with that, I will remove myself and as soon as I'm gone and I'll add your screen, Sam, uh, as soon as I'm gone, you can you can do it. So first let's add your screen and then, all right, good luck and thank you. Thanks. So uh, hello, everyone. We're here today to talk to you about uh, automated software refactoring with uh, open rewrite and machine learning. Uh, I've already done our introductions. So we're going to talk about why uh, we're looking into or why we work on mass scale software refactoring, uh, introduce you to the underlying technology as it currently exists, and talk about how we're looking to or have begun uh, augmenting it with machine learning techniques and the direction we'll be continuing to take that in the future. Uh, there'll be a demo at the end as well as a few sprinkled throughout. So the, the, the software industrial revolution has arrived, right? The number of repositories, the amount of code in the world has just completely exploded, right? Even a small organization like ours has several dozen repositories and managing code across all of those, uh, and not just the code within them, but the entire kind of software supply chain of dependencies and vulnerabilities and uh, everything else that comes with shipping a modern software project is quite the logistical challenge. And not just logistical, but uh, challenge in terms of just work put into uh, just keeping afloat. <clears throat> you know, it, uh, you know, we have complex relationships of interdependencies between our projects and between our microservices. Uh, and each of those comes with their own set of dependencies that need to be uh, managed. You know, my, back in the day in the, you know, in the 90s, say, and maybe 80% of the, of, the, of the software shipped out the door at a company by weight would be code that was created in-house. And, you know, a, a minority of that code would be external third party dependencies, whether open source or provided by a vendor. Uh, these days, that has more or less inverted because we have such a rich and powerful ecosystem full of pre existing, well tested, long, uh, well supported uh, open source modules for all kinds of needs. Like, you would be crazy. At, or most organizations would be crazy to go and, you know, reinvent Spring, you know, if they needed a web server. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, you use an off the shelf, uh, component, you use something from open source, but that comes with its own challenges, uh, because now most, much of the, the, the software you're shipping out, you don't directly develop and don't directly, but you know, you are responsible for the effects of how you use that software and how, and how that affects your customers. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, and so when you have this large uh, supply chain uh, of dependencies that are you know necessary to ship your software and necessary to uh, uh, to make your business run, well, you all of those all of those dependencies that are core to core to your operation have their own life cycles of new features being released and new security vulnerabilities being discovered and new patches being put out. And just as the number of repositories and the amount of code in the world is, you know, has exploded and continues to explode exponentially, you know, so too does the number of CVEs and other vulnerabilities in software, you know, uh, go up. Uh, so this presents a real challenge for organizations and for individual software engineers because you can spend a ton of time on managing the software supply chain and find that your velocity on you know your business logic that that 20 percent that most important 20 percent of the software you're shipping out the door you know the value you are adding uh, and the the integrations you are doing on those open source components uh, can be slowed down and hampered by managing the uh, having to manage the supply chain behind it. <clears throat> and so, kind of the the solution for this that we that we have come up with is to do automated uh, source code refactoring, right? Uh, our the, the founder of Modern, Jonathan, started this technology when he was back at Netflix, working on a on a tools and infrastructure and developer experience team who had you know simple uh, simple mandates like let's get off this vulnerable version of a logging library or uh, something like that and needed to push that throughout the organization. But they had a rule that, uh, or a, both maybe a rule or a, a cultural practice or, or both, that uh, they weren't allowed to break feature teams. So they needed to ask feature teams to go and update uh, their code to be in compliance with you know, the latest fixed version of whatever library or, you know, whatever thing had a vulnerability. Uh, and those feature teams were like, well, we're focused on delivering value. Like we're focused on carrying out our mission. Uh, we, you know, we, it's not that we don't want to be compliant. It's not that we don't want to be on the latest version of this library, uh, but it's a hassle, right? It takes away from, from the thing we're trying to get done. We would love, we would love to accept a pull request from you that did this for us. And so Jonathan went and created the first version of, uh, of Open Rewrite at Netflix in order to do just that, uh, since he couldn't be going to you know 500 or 1,000 repositories himself and making all of the code changes by hand, developed a technology to affect those code changes on his behalf. And the most kind of fundamental unit of that technology is what we now call the lossless semantic tree. You know, as human programmers, we're all used to interacting with editing and authoring code uh, in the form of text uh, inside of a compiler or an interpreter. That text is translated into an abstract syntax tree, which, uh, you know, represents the, 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 the structure of the code. Uh, and in order to make the most accurate, the most precise, you know, the most enlightened uh, programmatic changes to code, well, you know, you don't want to operate on text because, you know, a reg even your most finely crafted regular expression will surely run afoul of the, the, the particulars of the syntax when tried across a large enough code base. And just the abstract syntax tree is often not enough uh, to act with complete confidence. Uh, you know, for example, the, the, and the abstract syntax tree representation of a log.info call that's going to an SLF for J logger versus a log.info call to a log for J logger looks the same in an untype attributed abstract syntax tree. So in order to kind of have access to all of the same information that a human programmer would have access to when editing code, uh, we fully type attribute the syntax tree so that we know the, the type of every symbol inside of it. We include use, uh, other useful metadata, like what stuff is on the class path, the full transitive dependency closure, you know, what build tools it was built with, all of these things that might be relevant uh, in order to affect a transformation with great confidence in the correctness and the specificity of that transformation. Yeah, so, you know, you um, probably already... Sam, oh, yes? sorry to interrupt you. I just, I, I wanted to just have a little more sort of chat around that last slide because this is sure. when I started learning about uh, Open Rewrite and uh, and what Modern is doing, 
this part, this part of it, I mean, to me was really fascinating because me and my very, very primitive, you know, basic mind, if I'm going to go update code, I'm going to write a bash script and do like some text, you know, sure, yeah. search and replace and become a regex max master and think I'm doing well. So, totally. um, <laughs> so this concept, um, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit interested in, in sort of like the history of this concept. Was it, sure. was it being used maybe before open rewrite or, no. um, yeah, sort of a little more about this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, I, I would, I would never uh, cast aspersions on the noble and useful regular expression. I have uh, I've edited many a many a file of source code and everything else with regular expression find and replaces. Uh, the, you know, kind of like I said, the the challenge of programmatically editing, you know, not just one line of code, but a you know a thousand, ten thousand, a million, ten million lines of code, and doing so correctly uh, without any mistakes uh, becomes increasingly more difficult, you know, with the, or the, the likelihood of, of running into an error or making an incorrect change uh, approaches one, you know, the more, you know, if you have a regular expression that's right 99% of the time, well, that's already probably not good enough with only a few dozen source files because code is so very particular, right? If you have one semicolon that's misplaced, you don't have code anymore. You have a compiler error, right? You have nothing. So changes need to be uh, precise and accurate. And with purely text-based manipulations, there's just there's a hard upper limit on how accurate you can be. I mean, one, a tool like a regular expression is very bad at even just doing things like matching, opening, and closing braces correctly. Now, you know, there's some regex wizards out there who can make that work in, in, in some circumstances some of the time, but the sheer amount of both uh, syntactic and semantic variability just limits how effective those methods can be without uh, planning for, okay, we did we did everything we could with a big find and replace. Now humans go and fix all of the compile errors that we introduced, right? And go fix all of the you know, behavior errors we introduced. So if you move from a textual representation to a structural representation, now you can make edits and be pretty confident you're not going to mess up the syntax, right? Because you'll, you know, you'll, you're not fiddling with the text class A, you're fiddling with a, uh, a tree representation of, of, uh, of that class declaration, uh, <clears throat> which, you know, a regular expression, you can easily take some Java and turn it into something that isn't Java. But if you're working with a, an abstract syntax tree, it's always going to be Java in the end, more or less. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about opening and closing braces or anything like that. But that representation alone still doesn't capture all of the richness of what a human programmer knows about uh, knows about the code. Uh, things like, you know, going back to that example of, you know, a method invocation of log.info. Is that is that call to log? Is that on SLF for J? Is it on log for J? classic you might be saying i don't care but if it's up to you to fix a security vulnerability that affects one of those libraries and not the other then the answer to that question is really important to being able to make a code change with great confidence in its correctness and so we take this the abstract syntax tree and further uh enlighten it with context that is then available to the recipe uh that has been available to the refactoring operation uh, so that you have, you know, all the information a human programmer would have. Uh, but I believe you also asked about the history. You know, we are not the first people to think of manipulating code through an abstract syntax tree. I mean, indeed, that's a concept that has been internal to compilers almost as long as there's been a concept of compilers. Uh, and like for Java, you know, the first language we support, uh, or the, the first language we supported to a, a great deal of maturity, the, um, uh, we take the compiler's internal representation of its abstract syntax tree, and then we map that onto our lossless semantic tree. And I see uh, Raul has asked a question about the readability of the code, and that is just such good timing because the one of the key differences between the compiler's abstract syntax tree and our lossless semantic tree is a compiler wants to generate bytecode, so it doesn't care about comments or white space anymore. It has already thrown that information away. But we're not trying to generate bytecode. We're trying to generate patches and pull requests, things that a human reviewer will look at and accept 
and no human reviewer is going to accept it if you strip out all of their comments and you know totally mangle the white space so our you know the lossless and lossless semantic tree is all of those little bits of white space and padding and formatting we preserve that so that we can make the most minimal least destructive diff possible uh and indeed you know speaking specifically to the question of readability uh, we will do things like auto detect the code style. Uh, you know, are they using tabs versus spaces? Where are the curly braces placed? You know, these kinds of things uh, in order to make a, you know, have the same recipe, which makes a, you know, a semantic change, tries to change the meaning of some piece of code, look native in whatever context it's making that change. So the same refactoring operation, you know, in a project that uses two space indentation, it will there, it prints out with two spaces. And in a project which uses tabs, it prints out with tabs. So the um, lossless semantic tree is, is storing more metadata about any given node, let's say. Absolutely. It has the type okay. information of all the symbols. It has the white space. It has, you know, it knows the, the full class path and the transitive dependency closure. Uh, yes, exactly. Gotcha. OK, awesome. Thank you. All right, I'll let you uh, go on with yeah. the presentation. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's a good, good question. Uh, so, you know, we've kind of touched a little bit on the use cases already um, of what you can do with this. And one is the, 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 the migration between major library versions or major language versions. You want to take your code base from Java 8 to Java 17? Well, you know, that involves, uh, you know, replacing deprecated methods with their replacements. That involves updating some dependency versions. That might involve changing some things in your Maven Palm or your build.gradle file or, uh, or similar. Uh, and recipes, which I don't think I've defined that term. So let me just pause for a second to define the term recipe. That is our term for a any unit of work that you are performing on a collection of LSTs, of lossless semantic trees. And a recipe could be a refactoring recipe, which goes and makes changes to that LST and then prints out the result to source code and you get a, a diff or a patch. Uh, it could be a search recipe, which goes and finds and annotates just the metadata of these elements to say, this class declaration is the one I'm interested in for the purposes of a search. Or it could emit a data table and collect tabular data uh, across uh, all of your rest, uh, across your sources, and then be something you analyze in, you know, a business intelligence tool, whether Excel or, or Tableau or Grafana or whatever suits your fancy. Uh, and I'll show all of these things in just a minute. Uh, to make this a bit more concrete. So, you know, there's the, the migration, there's uh, the security vulnerability scenario where, you know, somewhere in, in your uh, transitive dependency list, the, a CVE has been discovered and you need to fix it. Uh, and that can, again, involve a mixture of changes to code and data files and, uh, and dependencies. Uh, and so maybe that's something that I should, should mention that we are not able to just change code we also uh, parse uh, data files like JSON and YAML uh, and Maven Palms and build.gradle files into a similar uh, LST structured representation so that a refactoring recipe is not limited to considering just code or just one piece of code, but can look at the full gamut of what is in the project and can consider when making changes to say a Maven Palm, like I only want to add this new dependency if there's some piece of code that you know uses a particular data access pattern. These kinds of cross-cutting questions that are common to uh, a human programmer to make decisions based on are also available uh, for a recipe to make decisions on, since it can see all of these different kinds of things from your repository uh, in a full level of richness. I have another another question, Sam. Since you're talking yeah. about recipes. Um, yeah. Where do these recipes come from? And like, do they guarantee, I guess if somebody wrote a recipe, it's because they've done the research to guarantee interoperability at some yeah. level between the thing that they're updating and the things that are not being changed. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And it gets right to the, the, the heart of uh, kind of what we're talking about or what we're, uh, what we're uh, yeah, it gets to the heart of the matter. Uh, right now we have about a thousand refactoring recipes. Uh, almost all of these have been handcrafted by some human programmer. Uh, to operate on these LSTs and produce changes or to extract data from code. Uh, they largely live uh, under the uh, open rewrite organization in, uh, in GitHub. Uh, and I'll, I'll just kind of show you where our repositories are in a little bit here. Uh, and also, you know, they're contributed to by organizations like, uh, like you know, VMware and Spring will contribute recipes to 
the spring migration because uh, you know we do have a spring boot migration uh, if you find some gap in that migration that it uh, that it does not do everything that you want it to do you know bug uh, bug vmware to send us a pull request um so yeah so that's an excellent question uh, about the the nature of recipes and how complete and how correct they are so all of this information is available to a recipe but a recipe is a program created by a human uh, and uh, I've never written a bug, but I hear that's something that people do. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, yeah, just kidding. So yeah, they, they're, they're subject to all of the potential. You know, there's job security in writing bugs. So. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the, there's, um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's all the same potential for bugs or human error in a, in a, in a, in a recipe as there is in any other piece of software. Uh, that is written. So, you know, the, you know, you apply your software engineering best practices and well, maybe I should just go ahead and, and, and show you kind of our platform for, uh, for running recipes. So this is the, the Moderns public SAS, which is, into which we've loaded, I think the last count around 30,000 different rep uh, open source repositories from GitHub. And we have our, our library of about a thousand recipes that have that either we or others have contributed to, to open source uh, that can be run on all of these uh, repositories. So, you know, let's just make go ahead and, and run one of these, make this a little bit more concrete, uh, not so abstract when I'm talking about. So like, for example, for Java code, this is our common static analysis issues uh, recipe. Um, which runs, uh, which performs all of these different steps and fixes, you know, com common small code smells or anti-patterns that things your linting or static analysis tool uh, might complain to you about. Uh, but, you know, we're programmers. We're already ignoring a thousand warnings from the compiler, having another thousand warnings to ignore from a static analysis tool doesn't really move the needle on actually improving uh, the, the quality of our software. Um, so, you know, I've gone ahead and kicked off this run and it's running on, you know, 115 or so repositories right now. Uh, so if I just click on any random one of these, we see a diff uh, as to the, the changes this particular recipe has made. And this guy is doing things like taking advantage of Java's diamond operator to remove a redundant uh, specification of a type parameter. Uh, or making a variable final that has never changed and could never, you know, be mutated, uh, or that we know is never mutated, uh, and doing things like, you know, splitting uh, splitting a multivariable declaration across multiple lines. Uh, and if you're ever curious, you know, why a particular change was made by the system, well, we can ask. We click this button, and uh, we could see that these were the recipes that made changes to this particular file. You know, like I said, you know, use diamond operator. You know, no multiple variable declarations, finalize private fields, and the kind of rationale for why that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, if the coding standards in your organization or on your team happen to differ from what was in this recipe, uh, well, these recipes are uh, meant to, are made to be uh, composable where you can make a complex recipe out of many simple recipes. And probably, you know, might have already You've gotten an, gotten an inkling of that when we see that the common static analysis recipe is itself just composed of all of these other recipes. And so, you know, if you wanted to, in your organization, have a slightly different coding standard, well, we can, you know, you could customize it. You could say, oh, I don't know. Maybe you don't care about, you know, Boolean checks, you know, should not be inverted. And, you know, you could just remove that one from the list. And maybe there's some other recipe that you do really care about that isn't in our list. Well, you can add that to the list and create something that is uh, the right fit uh, for you and, uh, and your team. Let's see. So it looks like I see a question from Simon. I didn't see notice there's a Java 20 recipe. Uh, so, so Simon asked a question about there being a, a recipe for Java 20, uh, which was surprising. Um, I don't know about that specific recipe. I don't even know if that's one we wrote or someone in our open source community uh, uh, has contributed. I would imagine that in most cases, something that would make code uh, that would take you know Java 17 or earlier code and make it applicable to Java 20 
would also be helpful for making it applicable to Java 21. Indeed, our like uh, like our like our migrate to Java 17 recipe is composed out of our migrate to Java 11 recipe plus the kind of Java 17 specific things. Uh, and you know you could see that the the migrate to Java 11 from Java 8 is you know composed out of you know these little fixes. Uh, and so if we have like if there was a migrate to Java 20, which I don't know, has someone actually made that? Oh yeah, there's a migrate to Java 20. Yeah, okay, yeah, it looks like it looks like Knut has been working on the migrate to Java 20, and it's made out of the migrate to Java 17. Well, to that specific question, I might fully expect that if there is a meaningful difference between Java 20 and Java 21 in terms of what is or is not supported, that we might have a migrate to Java 21 recipe, which would continue to compose these simple recipes together. Uh, like Voltron into ever more complex and powerful forms. Let's see. And so I got a question from Raul about uh, there being a lot of opinionated programmers about out there. How about the process of them adapting to the resulting code? Um, well, to a certain extent, whoever tries to solve people problems with technical solutions is doomed. Uh, but you can take, you know, as many technical steps as possible to make the resulting uh, code or diffs easy for a human programmer to accept. And we've talked about that a little already in terms of uh, maintaining, like, uh, you know, white space or formatting. Uh, I don't know if we would see an example since this is, you know, a live demo and I'm just clicking around looking for stuff. Ah, but, you know, you, know, you kind of see here that, you know, in this context, you know, we maintain the two space indentation where in other projects that had, you know, four space indentation or tabs, we would keep that. Uh, so the philosophy uh, that the framework and that recipes are written with is almost to try to make the most minimally invasive, minimally disruptive change possible because everything else being equal, it's easier to accept a code review with fewer changes and fewer extraneous changes rather than more. Uh, let's see, is there a certain curation recipe wise? Wouldn't let a recipe that was Lombok. Yeah, well, I mean, is there a certain curation? I mean, anything You're in our pull requests, right? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So, you know, if I want to, you know, right now, this diff, you know, I haven't changed anything in Spring Project, Spring Shell, but if I, you know, wanted to, well, then I can go ahead and, uh, you know, if I am a committer on that repository, which I'm not, I could commit directly, uh, or I could, you know, if I had permission to create a pull request, which I probably also don't, uh, I could do that. Or if, you know, I'm just some guy on GitHub, which I am, I could create a, a you know, have the system create a fork and create a pull request from that. And so then it is up to, again, the human process of code review and CI builds running and everything uh, to come to a decision about whether or not to accept that change. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess this question is also maybe specifically asking about things like a, a bigger change, like a Lombok, you know, two records. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, you know, the recipes don't do anything on their own, just sitting there until you run them. So if it's something you want to have in your organization, uh, or in your repository, yeah, go run the recipe and, and, and commit the results. And if you want to keep your Lombok annotations and not move away from it, then, you know, don't. What do does that. a recipe look like? That's and that's the last question I'll ask, and then I'll, I'll let you move on to. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. And we'll actually be, uh, we will be demoing the source code of a couple different recipes uh, in a little bit here. Um, so let's, okay, let's hold I, off you know, on. We can let you go off. Yeah, go on yeah. with your normal flow. Okay, yeah. see you guys soon. Yeah, so let's see. So let's see. If we go back to the scenarios, right. So we talked about uh, software migration engineering. Uh, so for like security vulnerabilities, let's run our, so we have this recipe here, which looks through your transitive dependency closure and compares that against the entries in the GitHub security advisory database uh, in order to find out, similar to many scanning tools, whether or not you have uh, vulnerabilities that you might uh, might be concerned about. Uh, and so 
in cases where the the difference between the version that you're currently using and the version that has the fix is very minor. Well, I mean, not minor, is a patch version difference. We might uh, helpfully try to go ahead and just make that version bump for you uh, in order to save you, save you the trouble. Uh, and obviously it's configurable about whether or not you want to, you know, in the case of a dependency like this, the version is being managed elsewhere. So it's, you know, by a bomb or by a parent POM or something. So it's a configurable option on the recipe, whether you would want to override a managed version with an explicit version. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, which I've turned on for this demo so that you can kind of see some of the code changes that it would, it would make to help. And in addition to making these handful of changes to Maven POMs, it also produces a data table, uh, which I may have alluded to already. Uh, and a data table, this you know vulnerability report is you know tabular data available in comma separated value or Excel, which looks like this. Let's go in. And so, uh, in this, so this records all the vulnerabilities we discovered looking across uh, all of these different repositories, and you know we record which repository it was found in, uh, the particular, the list of CVEs uh, found in the dependencies of that project, the the GAV coordinates of the vulnerable dependency, the version that the uh, fix is available in, and uh, speaking of recipes having bugs, this. I would expect this to this could be fixed with version update only column uh, to only show true if it, there was a patch version difference between these two, which is obviously not the case. It's a major version difference. Uh, so we may have to look at the code that's generating that particular column, uh, and then it records you know also the the summary of the vulnerability as reported, or the summary as well as the severity as reported in the uh, the uh, the GitHub Security Advisory database which is a, a super, if you're not familiar with it, is a superset of the vulnerabilities reported to uh, directly to GitHub, as well as to uh, NIST, you know, National Institute of Standards and Technology, US government organization, which issues uh, CVE numbers uh, and the like, as well as a, a couple other sources. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And so, you know, this is a very powerful Oh yeah, thanks, Simon. <laughs> glad, uh, glad you glad you're appreciating the content so far. Uh, yeah, and so you know, a recipe can be can make changes. It can query information. It can do one, the other, both, uh, in order to yeah help you keep on top of your software supply chain. And then there's the improved code quality and standardization, and that's kind of did the slightly out of order perhaps. It showed that first. Uh, but yeah, you know, right, you know, fixing your sonar cube, find bugs, uh, check style complaints. You know, I know it just personally drives me absolutely crazy. You know, the first time I saw, you know, a tool like check style complaining that on this line at this column, there should be a space. And I'm like, if you know that specifically, why didn't you just put the space there for me? It was like an insult to me to receive this, you know, to have my build break with this kind of message. And that really uh, underlines our kind of philosophy of going about creating these tools of like, let's just not give you like your to-do list, your task list is long enough already. Well, you know, it's not, I don't want another report that says, here's 10 more things you need to do. I want to say, you know, a tool that says, I've taken these 10 things off your to-do list. You know, you're welcome. Have a great day. You know, go work on something more important or something more interesting afterwards. Uh, and so that's that's what we try to do in every in every case. Yeah, so I've already kind of talked about you know how we parse code and how we parse data files, and we and my team specifically uh, is working on expanding the list of technologies we support. You know, we have the most mature support uh, for Java. It was the first programming language we supported, and you know from there branched out into Groovy and Gradle and Maven and various data formats, you know, GitHub Actions, HashiCorp configuration language, you know, all of your, your YAML configuration and JSON and all of that. Uh, and we're, you know, very soon going to be releasing, we've already released a parser for Kotlin, very soon we're releasing a parser for uh, TypeScript and JavaScript. Uh, Python parser is is uh, also available in the, in the early, early stages. And uh, all of the core refactoring technology and all of the refactoring recipes I've shown you so far 
are uh, are open source. And at the end of the presentation, there will be a slide pointing you to uh, where we are on GitHub. Uh, yeah. So you know, this is the, the kinds of problems I've described. Even though Java was our starting point, are really affect our entire industry. So we're trying to to bring that power and to bring this transformative ability to well everywhere that programmers are. Uh, although you know, not C++ for a very long time probably. So if you're, C I don't think there's many C++ devs in the audience, but uh, you know, yeah, don't don't hold your breath on that one. Uh, but you know, hey, a few years down the line, anything's possible. I guess just one question on that, Sam, sure. is uh, the there there's a question here about like sort of who would own it, right? So I guess yeah. part of you part of your work as 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 VP of engineering is to decide yeah. what what you're going to own as as modern versus what you're going to look to partners or yeah, Can absolutely. Support? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, excellent question. So, you know, we want to be, we're a, you know, we're a small, a small, pretty new company, you know, we're, we're venture backed, been around for a couple of years. Uh, but, you know, we have uh, a dozen, uh, you know, a dozen, you know, less than 20 engineers say. Uh, and so, you know, where like my team wants to be is creating the core refactoring technologies, you know, adding new languages to the list add any major frameworks to the list. Uh, and we've you know, tried to seed the ecosystem with useful refactoring recipes as both to help people out and to be a good proof of concept. Uh, but we don't have the, the breadth or depth of knowledge necessary to maintain uh, extensively tested uh, and always up-to-date recipes for every facet of every ecosystem that you know millions of programmers care about. So if you you know run our spring migration recipe and, and find a find an emission in there, you know find wish it did something else or find a bug, uh, you know nudge nudge spring to uh, to contribute to it and to and to help improve it. And, you know same with same with all of these others. We would love to move the industry to a place where uh, when a new major version of a library ships, you know what ships with it is the migration recipe that you know there's always some changes that are very hard to automate where you know an api is changed in such a way that a human programmer does need to make a decision about which of several paths they want to go down to deal with but you know 60 80 90 percent depending of the changes involved in keeping your your software supply chain up to date are automatable uh and so those we would like to see uh like to see automated I guess so. And as you're supporting more languages, does that mean different trees, or does one tree fit all? Uh, yes, a little bit <laughs> to, to both. So, in terms of the structure of our LST, most of the languages we support uh, have a common root in uh, in our representation of the the Java syntax or the Java Java LST. Uh, and, you know, we'll introduce a handful of elements that are language specific to each new language, like Groovy has a list literal and a map literal, and Java has no concept of that. So the Groovy language, you know, our Groovy LST has, you know, specific elements for those things, but it reuses the Java class declaration. And, you know, that's particularly easy in that case, because they're both, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that Golang will be challenging. Uh, it's also not uh, particularly on our on our schedule, but you know, never say never. Uh, yeah, so right. we yeah we try to we most like Kotlin, Groovy, Java all share the majority of their of their LST elements. Cobol is totally its own beast. <laughs> it's, it's syntax as, as and structure has no relationship whatsoever to to Java's, but. Uh, we try to keep the, the LSTs in just the number of different elements that need to be maintained to a minimum. Uh, and this also allows some interoperability where a recipe written for Java uh, can often successfully run on a, on a COBOL, or not a COBOL, a Kotlin LST or a you know, Ruby LST. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, and so you know, I've already already shown you running a few recipes on our public, uh, on our public SAS, but yeah, just to reiterate, you, know, you can run these recipes locally uh, via our Maven or Gradle build plugins, uh, or if you're know, working on open source project, you know you're welcome to use the public.modern.io, which I've been demoing from. Anyone with a GitHub account can sign in there. Uh, so yeah, if you're a, an open source uh, maintainer or have an open source repository, uh, I encourage you to, uh, to to try that out, or just want to see how a recipe runs at scale. Uh, and you know, we use this for testing. You know, there's a question earlier about how do we ensure the the quality and consistency of the recipes. 
and running them across a real code and looking at what fails is a big part of that. Uh, but I see that I've already taken more than half the time, so it's time to start turning things over to Justine, where we start talking about how we take things to uh, the next level. Because most of these recipes, well, almost all these recipes are handcrafted by a human programmer, uh, and the industry is both broad and deep. Uh, so quickly creating new recipes and uh, getting more value out of the, the LSTs uh, that we're able to parse is uh, something we're looking to leverage AI to do. Uh, increasingly, or machine learning. And so, Justine, why don't you tell us about that? Thank you, Sam. It's uh, always a pleasure to listen to those talks, but the one you just, your version of it was particularly uh, really fun to listen to. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, all right, so now my turn to take over. So yeah, so the idea, you know, writing these recipes, as Sam said, uh, human written, and although they save a lot of time for development, it's nice to be able to add some automation even more. So where are we looking at? We're looking at machine learning for code applications and how can those machine learning models work hand in hand with our rule-based approach, which is open rewrite. Thank you. So um, here's basically the three main directions that uh, Modern's heading into and where we think uh, the first few steps we could do. Um, the first one would be to fine tune a pre-trained large language model on writing these recipes. Um, so we could give the model a prompt, for instance, write a recipe which does X, Y, Z. And the idea would have to, the model output the recipe using open rewrites framework. Um, I forgot to mention, if I say some technical terms that you don't know, uh, please stop me, feel free. Uh, this slide kind of will have some technical terms. I will go in more uh, detail to explain some of them uh, as we go through. So if you look at the second bullet point uh, and the graph on your right, you'll see these little colorful little clusters. So one of the things we want to do is to analyze uh, code and be able to give this analysis to clients so that they can better understand their code base. Uh, here what we did is just a very simple example of using embeddings of stack traces when there was an error built. And so we take that error message and we uh, get an embedding by passing it through a large language model. In this case, we use star coder. And then the embedding we got back is 700 plus float long. So obviously this is a 2D graph. So what we did is that we flattened it um, using TSNE to be able to have it in 2D. So when those are flattened, now you can see you have the X and Y coordinate, but again, those are meant to be a flattened version of the 700 plus dimension we had originally. When we have these different colors, what we see, which is really the key point here, is that we're able to group the errors in corresponding uh, clusters, meaning that they're gonna be similar to each other. So if ever there is a lot of stack traces that say failed because of some particular library, you would expect the embedding to be similar for those who failed for the same reason. So here we chose uh, 10 clusters and we used k-mean clustering with those embeddings to be able to get this. So this would give insight uh, to the client uh, or whoever wants to you know, do, use, use this for their uh, code base to get an idea of what problem they should maybe tackle first or just get a, night, a first glance view of um, the health of their code base. And the third bullet point, uh, so we could use also AI to describe code changes. So these descriptions of code could provide a, a good starting point for understanding the client's code base. All right, so bear with me. I'm gonna do a little bit of history of ML applied to code. Um, I will try not to go too deep. I love this, so sometimes I do, and I apologize ahead uh, in advance, but uh, hopefully we'll keep it short and sweet so we can have lots of questions. And uh, we also have another demo, demo at the end. All right, so how did um, the field do before dealing for tasks that had to do with code? Well, um, they, they would use graph neural networks. So let's go back in a little bit and talk about graphs. So the trees that Sam has shown us, those are a type of graphs. A graph is a data structure that contains edges and nodes. Uh, so if we were to do a social network, nodes would be people and the edges would be their relationship between them. So boss, friend, spouse, parent, etc. So what are the pros of using graph neural nets for code? 
So as we saw, um, they act on graph, right? Hence the name graph neural nets. Uh, and this is useful because graph is how we are able to represent code in a very intuitive way. So when we have non-included data, such as um, the loss of syntax tree, the abstract syntax tree, or even a molecule, you're able to use those techniques, which you wouldn't be able to use other types. So a molecule would be represented by having, say, the atoms as the nodes, and then the edges in between them would be the bonds. Um, but what are the cons? Because there are definitely some in almost everything in life. So, well, they're not quite the state of the art anymore. Um, they, they, when they first started and uh, started getting really popular in 2017, uh, they were really successful, and which is why they got very popular. There was a paper uh, that did basic deductions. Uh, so it would do some logic task where it was given a set of rules or almost axioms uh, where it was like A has fear of B, B is C, and then you would ask the model, does A have a fear of C? And you would want it to answer yes, because C is B as one of the rules that it was inputted. This was hard back in 2017. I know it's hard to believe that it was that not a long time ago. Um, and they were doing actually pretty well. And they were one of the first to do pretty well on that task. Uh, and you also have Microsoft, who had a paper in 2017, so the same year as the paper I just talked about, who uh, introduced two tasks, which used graph neural nets the one of the tasks was finding the names for the variables. So we would have the same abstract syntax tree we kind of been referring to. And then we would point to one of the nodes and say, what would be the name? What do you think? And it, we so it would be able to, by looking at the rest of the code, see that maybe, oh, it seems like we're summing stuff on this integer. Maybe we should call it sum. Um, another task that I would do is we would ask the model, do you think this variable is being misused? And it would, it would output a yes or a no. So um, the G and Ns are a bit slow to train, uh, mostly due to the problem setup. Uh, but there are obviously libraries now to speed them up. And although they're not state of the art, they sometimes are necessary because of the problem setup. So you'll see like AlphaFold still uses uh, some, it some makes sense, uh, graph neural nets. Thank you. All right. So graph neural nets, all right. Not you know, still, I love them. I love them so much. That's what got me into machine learning. But um, there's transformers that entered, and they kind of changed the game. Uh, so this was uh, first introduced in a paper called Attention is All You Need. So let's talk about attention. So if you look at the left, you see the attention mechanism, which is the key important concept in transformers, hence their name, the name of the paper. Um, so what the attention does is it lets each word's meaning change based on the other words around it. By meaning, I mean the vector representation of that word. So intuitively, you can see it as every word can give uh, information that it has to the other words. So to make it a little bit more simple or more intuitive, uh, here's an example. So if I said, Sam opened the freezer door. He took his favorite snack, which is a Mm, blank. Ice cream. This is what we're trying to fill. <laughs> there you go. So a really good large language model or transformer would, we would want it to maybe guess ice cream or popsicle. What we wouldn't want it to answer is orange sandwich, you know, stuff that doesn't necessarily belong in the freezer. So this attention mechanism will help us. And if you see at the top of the graphic on the left, it says multi-head. So this is a process that happens mul multiple times. Uh, in parallel. So you might want it to maybe find the semantic attention. So when you're looking at the word, uh, the masked word, which in this case we filled with ice cream, we would want it to pay attention to snack and to freezer. Because for semantic reasons, this gives us a lot of intuition of what that word should be. When we are maybe looking more at the syntactic information, we would want to look at the fact that there was a determinant a before. So it would be that would give us some clue on to what would be the next word. All right. So on the right, if you can, if we continue our, our look there, uh, you'll see basically the whole transformer uh, architecture there. 
Um, so you'll have the encoder on the left and the decoder on the right. Um, I'm going to start speeding up a bit. Um, on the left, you have basically what will help give us an embedding. So it, it looks at all the words, while the decoder will basically uh, help us generate something that we need at the end. All right, so let's continue. So what's so good about these uh, transformers? Well, they were really easy to parallelize because of this multi-head that is, uh, because it's running in parallel, you can you know, spread it onto different GPUs and have it learn that way. Um, it's also freeform, meaning you don't necessarily need to say, okay, I have five classes as output because words, text is your output. Therefore, you can also ask it, you can use the same model that was just trained on text to do multiple different tasks which, without having to always retrain it. The downside of freeform means that there's, you need a lot of data to be able to learn and generalize well. Text is complicated, as we know. It takes, takes us many years to learn it well uh, from when we're babies. So for models as well, there's definitely some uh, intricacies that it needs to learn and it needs a lot of data for that. All right. So scaling is all you need, as you can notice, uh, uh, is all you need has become a little bit of a cliche in the machine learning. There's a, many papers that use this uh, way of phrasing their titles. Um, so what, what scaling is all you need kind of showed uh, was that for these models to get good, they need a lot of data and they need themselves to be big. Um, so we can thank you know, huge internet and GPUs for this large scale training All right, so let's go back to code now. Um, so OpenAI uh, and uh, GitHub introduced Codex. And so that was the model Codex that powered uh, Copilot at first. So what Codex did was that it was a very, very large language model. And when I say large language model, I mean a transformer, but we're talking like very big. So the amount, the, the size of the embeddings, the size of the vocabulary, the size of the mini neural nets that are inside that transformer architecture are very big, meaning they can learn more easily. Um, so these large language models uh, are first trained on language. So it was, Codex was built onto GPT-2 um, which you might recognize from chat GPT. Um, so GPT-2 uh, was trained on a bunch of texts, Wikipedia, internet, anything out there that it was able to get its hands on. And it trained for multiple, multiple days. Uh, I think at first GPT-2 took like two months to train. Um, although now they're a bit faster because they just paralyze on a lot of data, on a lot of GPUs, I, pardon me. And then finally, they would fine tune on a code repository so that Codex could be good at generating code. So I don't know if some of you have used Copilot um, when it first came out a year or two ago. And, you know, it is very good. It's quite useful. Uh, and it, it definitely, I think, has uh, shifted a bit the attention on what uh, these large language models can do. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So what are the things that generative AI can do? So this is uh, what we call sometimes large language models. So obviously it can generate code, whether that is an end of sentence or a full function. Uh, it can do that based on prompts or it can just you know, continue where you left off on your code. It can extract and use embeddings in downstream tasks. So that's what uh, the encoder part of the transformer would do. It leaves you with basically a vector of numbers that you can use and these numbers have meaning and we can use them to maybe do downstream tasks. So that could be finding bugs. That could be um, also to see if two codes are similar. So that can be useful for finding plagiarism and coding assignments, and also to find some features such as uh, Star Encoder did, where they were trying to find uh, personal identifiable information in code bases. Yes, yeah, so we have just about five minutes left. Uh, do we? we uh maybe want to get we can, to... yeah are you guys do you guys have a hard stuff because on our side we could go over five or ten minutes but if okay, you yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's on... totally fine we can go over five or ten minutes i just want to be right, respectful then. of everyone's I'm... time as much as possible I might yeah. get and we are recording out, uh, but i might get oh. kicked out of the room that i've booked but it doesn't seem like no one's waiting so should be okay, okay. fingers crossed okay cool all right, um, but what are some cons of generative AI, which is kind of one of the things we really want to talk about today, is that when using a code base online uh, to train these models, well, 
there's going to be bugs out there. And you know how I know it's because my code is hosted on there. (laughs) Joking aside, like Sam mentioned, code changes. And sometimes it's not because the original code wasn't good or, or had bugs. It's just that with all these libraries that are dependent of each other, when there are changes, it might just not work anymore. So, and there are vulnerabilities also that are introduced that we, not introduced, but that we find later time. Um, So those are definitely things that the model is just gonna, you know, spit out and uh, without really knowing that it had a bug. So additionally also the models, you know, will have some issues on some tasks. Obviously every day researchers are closing the gap on that and finding new ways of solving different tasks, but there is gonna be some variability as well in uh, how well the models produce. It really depends what task. And there's a lot of not only fine tuning, but hyper parameters tuning, which is more deciding on how much uh, randomness do you want your model to generate out and that kind of stuff. Large context windows also remain a challenge. Um, lar- context windows are basically the size of the input that you let your model have. Uh, The reason why they are restricted is because the more your inputs is bigger, the more computation you have, right? Because if you remember the attention mechanism, every word's paying attention to every word. So this grows and grows and grows to a point that, you know, their computers could not uh, handle it anymore. And then finally, these models, if you want to use the ones hosted by different companies and use their API calls to, to either get the embeddings or generate some the end of line, well, they cost money. And of course, there's a way for them not to cost money. There's great researchers everywhere who are making these open source models, which are just as good as the closed source. However, they sometimes necessitate this um, a little bit of machine learning background to be able to get them to work for your task. And also they require your own resources to sometimes be big enough. We have models that are you know, is so big that you need multiple, multiple GPUs to be able to run them, which is not what people normally have at home. Um, so they might still have to use servers, which then again, costs money. Okay, so let's go back to um, open rewrites. Now that we've kind of had a bit more intuition on what the different technical terms I used. So, what can we do? Well, we can fine tune these large language models on recipes so that they can generate their own. And we would do that by giving them a prompt and then it would be able to spit out the recipe or at least part of the recipe. Um, we can use their embeddings for downstream tasks, including this one where we cluster the stack errors, but we could also, as you see in the third point, use it to describe changes between code and get an idea of what, what has changed between two um, repository or code changes. So now onto the demo. So we wanted to show how um, how the first intuitive way of using generative AI to do these um, changes and code refactoring, because if you've used these models, you see they're very powerful. Well, Sam is gonna show us why maybe we're going in a different route, which is to fine tune on the recipes instead. Yeah, so I thought I would go ahead. We have a question earlier about what a recipe looks like and this demo is of comparing a recipe that like almost all of our recipes was handwritten by an engineer uh, with one where we have been experimenting with using uh, machine learning to accomplish similar effects. Uh, and so to speaking to the, the question that was asked earlier about what does a recipe typically look like, uh, we provide or open rewrite provides a visitor style uh, data access pattern uh, in order to uh, affect code transformations on a tree. And so here's a very simple visitor uh, that uh, if we had scrolled through the results of the common static analysis run long enough, we might've found an instance of, uh, which just enacts the Java idiom of putting the default case in a switch statement last after all the other cases have been examined. Uh, and this is just a, a test for this, uh, this recipe showing the before text uh, that when the recipe is applied to this code, this is the expected result. Uh, and the recipe uh, itself, you know, looks like this. We go and visit a switch statement and then, you know, do, you know, some 200 lines of logic in order to handle all of the various permutations of switch statements 
uh, and to put the default case last. Uh, and, you know, 200 lines, you know, that's that's not overwhelming in terms of complexity, particularly once you're familiar with the uh, with the the, the the framework. But that was uh, surely at least a few hours of work for even a, someone proficient with open rewrite to create. Uh, and so let's compare that to the a very similar a recipe with a very similar purpose that we have used uh, OpenAI's model uh, to enlighten. And so here's the test cases for that, which, you know, does the same thing, puts the default case last. But this recipe's implementation just looks like this, where we, again, narrow it down to focus just on switch statements. And then we uh, pass it off to a language model. Uh, in this case, I believe it's the, the OpenAI model. And we are making an API call for this. Uh, the, the direction we're looking to go in the future is to embed models that uh, Justine will train in Open Rewrite uh, to perform these kinds of analyses she's talked about and to uh, facilitate with the authoring of recipes. Um, but this demonstrates both the, the, the promise and the pitfalls, perhaps, of using uh, a, a language model in order to affect changes in code directly. Because when I run this model, and I've got it set up to, to run this test in a loop uh, 10 times, presenting, unlike you know our normal handcrafted recipe, uh, which, you know unless someone introduce some random number, uh, some random choices in there, uh, always produces the same uh, outputs given the same inputs. This uh, model-based one does not always produce the same output for the same input. Uh, I wonder if some of these are rate limiting. So, you know, on, well, just about half the time it successfully produced the result we wanted. And the rest of the time there was some kind of difference like in this case, it did put the default case last, but it also reordered this case, which isn't something we wanted to do. Uh, and so you can kind of get into the, the query engineering or query tuning uh, in order to try and ask the model uh, nicely to do more specifically what you wanted it to do. So just to clarify what was happening there. So you're, you're yes. taking the test code and using yes. that as input for the model to generate the recipe and then applying the recipe such that every one of those 10 runs that you did, it's generating a new recipe? Well, so it's we have the same recipe. It's just a step in that recipe, which takes the switch statement and then asks the model, hey, rewrite this so that the default case comes last. And that and the, the, the model is not uh, not entirely deterministic with what it produces. Uh, and so, you know, here's a way that um, kind of formal or analytical or human crafted uh, methodologies can be complementary with model based approaches, because, yeah, this this model produced uh, some changes or can produce changes that aren't what we want. And we have and we can and we will uh, adjust the, 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 the query we're asking of this model in order to uh, hopefully improve that success rate. But we've already taken one step to limit how erroneous this can possibly be by using, you know, our structured and deterministic uh, uh, LST visiting infrastructure to limit the potential changes to just switch statements. And, you know, you can imagine that we could add some formal verification after this fact of like, is the default case last now? Were any other cases reordered? And do, you know, some of these kinds of things in order to maybe notice when the model has gone off the rails. But uh, but that also kind of, in, like this experiment has also kind of informed uh, the direction we want to go with, uh, with models and machine learning in this space in the future, which is not so much to ask the model in the middle of recipe execution to actually do the change, but to get a model that will help us to get started writing recipes so that you, know, you as a human recipe author would have a, have, a, have a jump start on creating that recipe, and then you can go and refine and correct the, the code it is producing. Uh, so that in the end, uh, you know, you kind of shaved off the, 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 the rote work of, uh, of creating that recipe by getting the, the model to do it for you. So now I'm running the test again with this updated, and maybe I should have zoomed this in a little bit so it's more legible for everyone, uh, with this adjusted, uh, query where I've asked it not to reorder any other test cases. 
And uh, we see that the success rate is much higher. We went from five out of 10 to nine out of 10. Um, yeah, and if you are curious about this, I want to play with either of these, these either the you know deterministic human authored version of this recipe or the, um, uh, the model powered version of this recipe. Well, like I've, uh, as I've mentioned, we, this is all open source on GitHub. You know, the primary uh, repository is under open rewrite, rewrite. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, here's the, you know, the, the, uh, the handcrafted version of that recipe. And if you want to play with this model based version that is also on GitHub under this, you know, rewrite generative AI repository, you will just need to put uh, your open AI API key into a token.txt file in the resources, because like I said, we're not yet embedding our own models in this. We're calling out to an external uh, model, which is accessed through an API, but I think they still have some free API access. Uh, yeah, let's see. That is the kind of the gist of the demo. Uh, any questions about what I've shown you so far? That was uh, fascinating. Um, uh, thank you both so much. It, yeah, definitely. If, if people have questions, uh, we'll stick around as long as Justine is allowed to stay in the room and, and Sam and Justine it seems good can so stay. Far. No one's waiting. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have um, some feedback that it was very clear. Thank so you, that's Sam. great. It was also, yeah, thank I you. found it to be really clear too. Um, and I think it's fascinating. I think, um, so I, I don't know if that I, you know, sometimes when we get started and we go live, my brain kind of escapes from my head, but uh, so I just want to make sure to say Sam Snyder is the VP of engineering and Justine is um, research engineer. And I feel like, um, especially Justine, as I watch with the, what you're working on and, and, you know, like with that totally English prompt to stick in the code, I see the link to, you know, the little bit that I've played around with, with open AI, with ChatGPT. And it's mm -hmm. fascinating to kind of understand like how, like to see, see in concrete how those things link together. And it's um, what a great mm -hmm. place to be uh, today, really, you know, right, right place, right time, very early. Um, mm -hmm. So Raul also says great product, great presentation and congrats. And I, I yeah. would certainly thank echo you. that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, glad you liked yeah. it. Yeah, please come check us out on GitHub, join our open source community Slack. Uh, if you want to talk directly with us about recipe authoring, code refactoring, software supply chain management, generative models, uh, or other use of machine learning models, uh, yeah, check us out on on GitHub. Contribute to it. You know, if you want to get started trying this stuff out, you know, docs.openrewrite.org has uh, quick start guides for you know Maven and Gradle plugins, and uh, and like I said, public.modern.io, where I was you know running those recipes live in open source code, is available for any. Uh, anyone with a GitHub account to try out running some recipes on. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, if you feel like you've covered everything you want to cover. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I think okay. so. At least for this time. Awesome. For this time. <laughs> <Thank> yeah. <you>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm going to, uh, I just need to let people know. So for this, so I'll sign this off in a second. Um, I just want to tell people. Uh, that uh, to please visit our Spring Academy website. There's free education on Spring, whether you're new or more advanced, I am sure you'll find something there. And also, uh, if you can join us in Las Vegas in August, uh, August 21st to 24th, we will have our Spring One annual conference. It's uh, going to be right before VMware Explorer, so you get a two for one. If you come along, you can get to both events. And uh, so with that, um, that's really it. So thanks. Thank you both so much. This was fascinating. And, and yes, congratulations. And uh, look forward to seeing what, what else you guys come up with. Thanks so much. All thanks right. for thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>